Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ on this 21st Sunday after Pentecost. A couple of people have asked me recently, um, I had put out an SOS when I lost my computer a little while, I guess a week or two ago, and it has turned up, yay. Um, it doesn't work because I disabled it remotely, so I, it's a little bit of a doorstop right now, but we'll get it going again here shortly, but thank you for your concern. I uh, also wanted to thank Kay Boone, Reverend Kay Boone, for serving as liturgist today. Pastor Damien is on vacation, and we are really blessed to have Kay as a member or as a part of our church. Uh, she thinks she's retired, but we made her chair of worship committee, and we regularly ask her to serve as liturgist. So God bless retired folks. Uh, and... Um, I think that will be it for today. Uh, I, I would say more, but I'm too full of barbecue. Um, just saying. But no, actually, I will say this. Uh, thank you for those of you who cooked the barbecue and served the barbecue and came and ate the barbecue. You um, helped to raise about $5,500 for disaster relief. And that is on top of the special offering that was collected on World Communion Sunday, which raised a little more than $11,000. So this is all um, money that will... We're in conversation with the Western Conference, uh, and we'll sit down together this week and figure out how that money can best be used to help people in the most, um, and meet with the most immediate need, and then also to fund work teams who can go up there until the work is done, which may be years. So thank you for your generosity. Today, let us breathe deeply uh, the Holy Spirit as we gather ourselves and center ourselves in the worship of God. Let us stand together for our call to worship. Where do we turn when our cries go unanswered? Where do we turn when we feel forsaken and alone? When we search for God before and behind us, but God is not there. Even then, we will commit ourselves to you, O oh Lord. Even now, we will put our trust in you. Come, let us worship. Uh, could you all stay standing and sing our opening prayer song?
still trying to figure out who does what. <laughs> All right, please join me now as we speak our call to worship. Our opening prayer. Our opening prayer. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I am so lost this morning. I got up too early. Damien owes me. <laughs> All right, if you'll see in your bulletin, <laughs> we've, got the, we've got, oh, this is going to be a tricky thing, too. You guys are left, you guys are right. And when it comes together and it says all, that means all y'all. <laughs> all right, let's speak together our opening prayer. When nothing is right, when we are weary and lost, when clouds dull the sky, help us to be still. When, when we, we think, think our cries are unheeded, when no efforts come to bear fruit, when the sun sets, help us to be still. For in being still, in refusing to panic or despair, we shall come to know that you are there, suffering alongside and with us, waiting to show us stepping stones through the soaring waters and to help us sing a new song. Every week, as we walk the path with Christ, we fall short of what is desired of us. So let us bow our heads now as we contemplate where maybe we've missed the mark this week. God of grace, we acknowledge that we've fallen short of your desires for us when we have offered our time and talents, we've shied away, preferring instead mindless pursuits. When you have needed our treasures, we've been selfish. When we should have been accepting, we have passed judgment and excluded some from our midst. Sadly, culture is the seductive voice that turns our hearts and minds away from the path Christ placed before us. Forgive us, Lord, so we may experience your grace, freeing us for a life of joyful simplicity, that we may be sons of grace in your word. Hear these words of blessing and assurance. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Now, as forgiven and reconciled children of our Lord, turn to one another and offer the signs of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, our ancestors trusted you and were delivered. They cried out to you and were saved. By living their faith with hope, they were not put to shame. In response to your word, may we do likewise that we too may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. The first reading is Hebrews 4 verses 12 through 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing it until it divides soul from spirit, joint from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare 
to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This ends the first reading. And now it is time for our children's moment, so I'll invite any of the kids that would like to come up and join me and see what I brought with me this morning. You all can have a seat right here or in these front rows of chairs. Good to see you guys this morning. So I brought something with me this morning. I brought a stuffy with me because I bet a lot of you have or had a stuffed animal or a toy or a blanket or something that makes you feel better when you need it or that goes with you places or that you go to sleep with or just snuggle with. And I thought about this with our Bible story that Miss Rhonda read us a little bit ago because I've actually got something else. I've got a uh, Jesus stuffy. We can tell you work for a church when you own a Jesus stuffy. <laughs> but these are kind of made for you to kind of hold on to. And that actually is a phrase that's in our Bible story today. It says that we can hold tightly to our faith in Jesus because our Bible story reminds us that Jesus came to be human and to be to do all the things that we do. And he knows when we're in good times or bad times what that is like because he has done it too. And so I'm reminded of that and I think about my Jesus stuffy, but that's really what we can do. We can hang on to Jesus when we are in need and know that because Jesus knows everything that we go through, that he gives us comfort and that he's with us wherever we go. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for all the reminders that we have that you're with us, that you know what it's like to be a human and to be um, in good times and in bad times. We thank you that you are with us and we hope that you will remind us to hold tightly to you no matter where we go and no matter what's going on. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks. Y'all can go back and be seated with your families or you can follow me to the nursery.
Our second reading today comes from the book of Job, the 23rd chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there, or backward I cannot perceive him. On the left he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick darkness would cover my face. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every Sunday we gather here, presumably because we think God is here, that we believe that the Holy Spirit is in this place on the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. We've been celebrating the Holy Spirit here for 21 weeks. And so we are students of Psalm 139. You know the psalm. I preached it recently. It's the psalm that says, Lord, you searched me. You know me. You formed my innermost parts. You knit me together. It's that psalm that says that God is always present, right? If I go, if I look behind me and before me, you're there. And if I go to heaven, you're there. And if I go to the depths of Sheol, you are there. And so we proclaim the psalm that God is always with us. And then today we have a new question. What happens when God's silent? What happens when we look around and God is not there, that we cannot behold God's face? At one church where I served, a a couple there who was in their 70s taught a Sunday school class. It was a Christian parenting class. And they were so loving and so kind. And they had spent really their whole adult lives shaping families. They were so dedicated. And they had a seven-year-old granddaughter, um, Virginia, and Virginia was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And so we as a church, we prayed for Virginia day in and day out. We prayed for her and we lifted her up and she was healed. Her tumor was removed. She got over her illness. And so in celebration, the family went to Costa Rica to, after this year of hardness, year of darkness, they went on a trip to celebrate and it was there in a freak accident that she lost her life. Her grandparents, who can blame them for saying, God, where are you? Where have you been? We look to the left and the right, and you are not there. In our deepest darkness, the deepest darkness of suffering, God feels entirely absent. I want to define this word suffering. It's a little bit different than the word pain. Often in our prayer group on Tuesdays, we will uh, pray for, for you, for members of the church who are in pain. And of course, we pray for your pain to be lifted. We pray for, for tumors to be gone and, and kidneys to be healed and, and joints to, be, um, to move easier. We pray for a lifting of pain. But suffering, on the other hand, is worse because suffering is what happens in the mind in response to pain. Suffering is how we reckon with that pain. Suffering is, is when we will look and say, gosh, why I've had this pain of this family member who hasn't called me and I don't know what to do with that. That's suffering. Suffering is when we remember that 
just two months ago, the mountains were intact and now they're in shambles. And in our mind, we wrestle with God over that. That is suffering. Suffering is where we make judgments about God. It's where we measure loss and where we, we say to ourselves, maybe there's something I need to confess. Or we say to God, why do you hold me guilty? Suffering is how we've, we make sense of the pain in our lives. And if you've ever suffered, then you know that this takes a toll on faith. It's often been said that suffering makes us all theologians. So what do we do? What what do we say to people who are in that gap between suffering and the silence of God? Is there anything we can say? It's very hard to, to, or not really even... um, commended to to give advice to someone who's in a state of of pain that we haven't experienced how do we say anything to that person to bring them comfort but this is the question in the book of Job Job suffers and God is nowhere to be found instead of proclaiming like Psalm 139 I look before and behind and you are there Job says if I go forward God you're not there if I go backward I cannot perceive you On the left, he hides. I can't behold him. I turn right, but I can't see him. So the question here is, what do we do in those moments where we are walking in the deep darkness of suffering? It's interesting to think about darkness. I know when I was a senior in high school, my parents set a curfew of 1 p.m. my senior year. And as my stepdad said to me, Mitzi, nothing good happens in the world after 1 p.m. 1 a.m., sorry. Nothing good happens after 1 a.m. And how true it is, right? There's really nothing that any of us need to be doing at 1 a.m. unless we work in a hospital or emergency responder. And, and what my stepdad was trying to say to me is, you know, when, you are, um, when you're in deep darkness, like in the middle of the night, and you feel that no one is there, that no one is watching you, you make judgments. We all make judgments about our life. We make judgments about what we can do and what we should do. And it's there in the moments of deep darkness that we show who we really are. So as Christians, probably the biggest test of our faith is when we walk in darkness and how do we respond to God in those moments where God seems to not be looking. So this is what Job is about. And if you read it, hoping to find some explanation of human pain and suffering, I'm sorry to tell you, you're not going to find it. Job does not explain to us why suffering happens, but what it does give is this story of of a man in a faraway place in a faraway time, and what he learns about different ways that we can respond to suffering. There are a couple of proposals that get batted about in this book, and there's different proposals and options that people choose, again, when they're in that dark moment, when they're in that deep suffering, how they respond. And some people deny God's existence. And if you think of someone in your life who is atheist or maybe agnostic, What explanation have they given you about that? I'd be willing to bet that most of the time what they say is, I don't believe in a God if there's still war. I don't believe in a God who lets a seven-year-old survive a brain tumor and then die on an ATV. It's usually not the science of God. It's usually not that they want an empirical proof laid out. It's where is God in the midst of suffering, and so they deny God exists. The other option that gets put forth in Job is uh, maybe that this is just God's will. Maybe we need to just resign ourselves to misfortune because that's just the way that God is. That's what Job's, one of Job's friends tells him. I think back often to C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, after his wife died. 
and he writes about that experience. He says, before she died, he could see God everywhere. Everywhere he looked, to the right and the left, was God. But when his wife became sick, he writes, meanwhile, where is God? He said it's like knocking on the door of a house, and the door is bolted right in his face. And he comes to this disturbing place for a minute, then says, maybe this is what God's like after all. And we hear that sometimes, even lately with uh, the storms that have happened in our state. You know, people say, well, who can know the mind of God? Maybe, maybe there was a reason for all of this. Job would step forward and say, there is no reason. God, he believes in God's justice. Job flat out refuses to let the door slam in his face. He is not going to accept that God slams the door in his face or that God wants misfortune to happen. And so he pounds on God's door. He comes to God indignant. He comes to God trying to reason with God. He comes screaming at God, crying at God. And while this might seem, you know, we, take, we catch our breath a little bit, are we really going to yell at God? Yes, because when he yells at God, it says that he's arguing with a God who exists and arguing because he believes God is just. He wants God to show up. And by the way, next week, God does show up in response to Job's crying and screaming. And we'll hear more about that then. The poet Rumi, um, who's a Sufi poet, writes of a man who every single night this man would go to sleep. And he would pray and pray until all of his words become, became words of praise. And so someone who knew the man came up to him at one point and said, hey, does God ever answer you back? And he goes, well, no. And that got the, the prayer thinking. So that night he, he fitfully did not pray, and he just drifted off into sleep. And in the midst of his sleep, the, the, the guardian of souls comes up to him and says, why did you stop praying? And he says, because I never heard anything back. And the guardian says, but this longing that you express, that's the return message. The longing that you have is your response and the message you have for God and the silence. And the poem that, uh, that then was written around that, he says, the longing you express, um, that, let me say, he says, the longing you express is the message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the name of. Give your life to be one of them. If you have a dog... You know the way they will sit before you on the floor and whine and whine and whine. Your dog doesn't look at you and say, well, I guess it's just the way it is. I don't get a treat today. Oh, well. Or I can see that some of you are cat people. So if your cat comes up and meows and purrs, my cat will walk across my face. I'm just saying. She does not sit back and say, oh, well. There are love dogs and presumably love cats that no one knows the name of. Give your life to be one of them. Job cries out persistently for 37 chapters. He never denies the existence of God. He doesn't say it's just the way it is. He has lots of arguments, but his arguments are with God. God is still present um, even in God's absence, that's the odd irony here. He's willing, he's unwilling to accept suffering. And he refuses to abandon his faith. So when we're walking in the dark and God is nowhere to be found, there's a lesson in Job's persistence and his conviction that he is going to have his day in court. Seeking out God in the dark moments of faith is about as daring an act as we can practice. The Psalms are 
are filled of people yelling at God. But as long as you're yelling, there is someone on the other end. I want to end with just a little word about suffering. And this is not really in Job, but since we are um, a people of a whole book, both Old and New Testament, let's just talk for a little bit about what we can say about Jesus Christ in the midst of suffering. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote letters in prison. He says that in a world of suffering, only the suffering God can help us. That Jesus himself, when he is on the cross, do you remember what he yells out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When we hear Jesus' cry on the cross, we know that God has taken our suffering up into himself and has felt every single minute of it. God knows how we suffer because God has also suffered. And we heard it uh, in, in today in Hebrews, right? We have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. We know that Paul reminds us that the good news of the gospel is that nothing can separate us from the love of God, not injustice, not suffering, not God's, the sense of God's absence. We become overwhelmed, but nothing separates us from the love of God. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we can take to heart when we are left to walk in the dark we can take our arguments, whatever they may be, to the eternal God who is with us in the midst of our walk. Let us pray. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you do know every minute of our suffering. You gather us to yourselves. Lord, thank you for hearing our cries, for being present even when we cannot perceive you. Lord, I pray that whatever people have brought into this sanctuary this morning, whatever hurts, whatever suffering they may be carrying, that they will feel a release this day that you are there and that you hear them and that you are acting and that you will redeem all of our sufferings. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Today we are receiving new members into the life of our congregation. I'd like to invite up um, all of our new members that are joining today, Chris and Kim and Nancy, if you'll come forward. Here, you get to stand in the middle. I'll stand on this end. Welcome, welcome. So if you haven't met them yet, uh, this is Kim, and Kim loves to hike and walk, and she also um, likes to read and dance and listen to live music. She is a real estate agent, and she has been active here in Sexton, I think, through Intrepid Hikers some, mm -hmm. and, um, and Chris also has joined her in Intrepid Hikers. And Chris, this is Chris Bowley, one of our two Chris Bowleys I found out today. We have another Chris Bowley in the back. Raise your hand, other Chris Bowley. There he is. Okay. So there you are. We have two. And Chris is uh, retired after a 49-year career in marketing and technical management of uh, crop protection. And he also hikes. And it's a good thing because he's about to get married to this one. And this means that they can hike together. Yes, you can clap. You can clap. <laughs> They are just a, a delight, and I, I hope you will take time to, to get to know them. And in the middle here is Nancy um, Tidwell, and Nancy has five grandchildren, is that right? And so she says she does a lot of babysitting, and she is also um, retired from owning her own business, and she has a house here uh, in, in Raleigh, but also in Valley Crucis, and so um, our hearts go out to her other community where she, that she is a part of. So we are so glad to have... Um, them join today. I have some questions for you all. The, uh, this is a renunciation of sin and profession of faith. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin, do you? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, do you? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races, do you? And according to the grace given you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world, will you? And then Kay has a question for our congregation. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include those persons now before you in your care? With God's Let's help, help. We, we will, will proclaim, proclaim the good news and, and live according, according to the example of Christ. We, we will surround, surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness, and forgiveness that, they that they may grow in their trust of God and be, and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together now in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe, I believe in God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of, of heaven and earth. earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his, his only Son, our Lord, our Lord who, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, died and was buried. He descended, he descended to the dead, and, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
And so you've heard uh, the congregation make their promises, and they've said that they're going to surround you with love and forgiveness and that they're going to pray for you. And so I have some questions to you um, about joining the United Methodist Church. Now, I know um, two of you are coming into the United Methodist Church. One of you is already a Methodist, but it doesn't hurt to promise again, right? So as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And then as members of Soapstone, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Will you? Now, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Join me now. We give, we give thanks, thanks for, for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as, as members together with you in the, in the body of Christ and in, in this congregation of Methodist Church. Church. We, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Now, may the God of all grace, who has called us to the internal, eternal glory of Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may go in grace, that you may live in grace and peace. And Chris and, and Kim and Nancy will be out in the narthex after the service and hope you'll take a time just to welcome them and, and greet them. Thank you. I'm so glad to be in the church family with you. Every week we come together as the body of Christ and we bow our heads in prayer. And this morning I would ask that you turn in your bulletin and make sure that as you go through your week, you lift those names that are listed in our prayer circle, along with those that you have listed in your hearts. Let us pray. Lord, we bow down before you knowing we, we don't always comprehend what is happening around us, and often we ask, why? Why me? Why us? Why those that seem so good in their living? Lord, sometimes it's just too much. Too much suffering, too much anger, too much bitterness, too much pain. Even though we've been taught you are with us always and we are never abandoned, our hearts still cry out in frustration, feeling lost. Sometimes we feel as if we're sitting in the darkness, that we're beaten down and we're desperate. Therefore, Lord, we pray today not only for ourselves and those that are hurting, but for all those who feel that they're sitting in the ash pile of confusion, shaking their heads and wondering, what, has been, what they have done to deserve their situation. We call on you, seeking courage and strength, comfort and peace. We lift our prayers, not just for ourselves, but also for those we have named on our prayer list and those that we hold silently in our hearts. Lord, open our hearts to the gift of your love and mercy. Help us to hear your voice in the midst of the noise of this world, noise that so easily distracts us. Remind us of your presence through those that you send to walk beside us, through the miracles that we see around us and the beauty of the nature that we see outside and through your quiet, soft voice that we hear in our minds. Give us strength to move forward despite the winds of destruction that whirl around us, threatening to overtake us. Take away our worries and regrets. Recharge our souls and renew our hope. Guide us with your love and share with us your joy. 
In your mighty name we pray, using the words that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time in our service, we are called to, to stop and reflect on the bounty of what God has given us. And as the body of Christ, we are called to give back to God's work. So as the ushers come forward, I would ask that you take the attendance pads and pass them down the row. Make sure you put your name down and any prayer requests that you have. If the ushers would come forward at this time.
Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light that shines in the darkness. And we offer you these tithes and offerings that through them, those who feel that you are far away will discover that you are as close as their very breath. And we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing and sing our closing prayer song. Thank you, Set in Stone, for leading us in worship today. It's just wonderful to hear your voices. I know before I ever came to Set in Stone, I saw you all online as you were leading. Some of you were leading at Pilgrimage, and I thought, how cool to be in a church that has a praise band of young people. As you go receive this blessing, may the God of all grace, who restores us to eternal glory, strengthen, strengthen your faith, make it firm and steadfast. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.